Okay, well, I think we got everyone in. So I just want to say hello and welcome to Digging In. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. And Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through November for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at the peabody.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. Viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function on the side of your Zoom screen. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we will give our speaker time to answer as many questions as they can with the understanding they might not get to all of them. Today, we are excited to have Dr. Ryan Collins. Dr. Collins is a postdoctoral fellow with the Newcomb Institute for Computational Science working between the departments of anthropology and geography at Dartmouth College. As an archeological anthropologist, Collins researches ancient urban centers and the lessons they hold for us with present day city living, social inequality, and environmental impacts. Currently, his research uses remote sensing to explore the development of complex societies particularly in ancient Maya cities across Eastern Mesoamerica. So welcome, Dr. Collins. Thank you for joining us today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. It's always a pleasure to be uh, back at the Peabody, even virtually so. Uh, so and thank you all for, for uh, joining us here today as well. Um, so what I'm going to do today, and I'm going to share my screen now. I believe I have the sharing capabilities. Yep. Um, and I'm going to share, let's see. Let's try that again. I'm going to share my PowerPoint slide. Sometimes not everything works properly with Zoom, so you got to give it a couple goes. Uh, but what I'm going to do today is talk about where my future and present research is going. Uh, all this with the caveat that um, in the COVID era, fieldwork has been a little bit stymied, especially going into Mexico. Uh, so my project wasn't continuing in Mexico this year for uh, some fairly obvious reasons to most of us in this room. Uh, and next year, uh, myself as well as a number of my colleagues are very optimistic that we can at least go back for continued remote work, at least in a socially distanced way. Uh, we're working with a number of remote sensing technologies that I'll talk a little bit about today, uh, involving uh, drones with LIDAR, ground penetrating radar units that allow us to be fairly social distance from one another, as well as from communities that could uh, at least help in the prevention of anybody getting contaminated accidentally. So with that being said, what I'm talking about here today uh, is sort of a, about a, a recognition of new methodologies for approaching the study of landscapes in the ancient Maya world. Uh, and now the study of ancient Maya landscapes has been changing a lot really just in the past 10 years or so. Uh, if we think about the origins of archaeology in eastern Mesoamerica or in the Maya area, most of the ways that we could study the ancient landscapes in the past had to do by creating large maps of sites. Uh, and that type of survey required a lot of time on the ground. Uh, it often required years and years of research uh, in order to create an accurate map and then have a sort of a good plan of where you could situate units in the past to get a sense of how that settlement might even compare to that of another settlement. Now, to put this in perspective, some, uh, some projects that uh, I've even been a part of have tried to put together maps in about a week or two. Those maps are never good, uh, but then sometimes those maps that, are, that take 15, 20, or even 30 years to render can be incredible. But yet, what we've seen with new forms of technology and remote sensing is that even those have been shown to be full of errors. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. Uh, and update the methodologies that have been used uh, in the Maya area, specifically since 2008. So aside from these older methods of mapping either with a compass point, a theodolite, or total station, it, you would also have more destructive methods for comparing settlements, which you might even go for full-scale deforestation, uh, which is not legal anymore, so that doesn't happen. Uh, it's also a terrible thing. We should not be deforesting sites entirely. Uh, but there's also excavation, of course, uh, which can be at times costly and also destructive as well. 
The less included forms of methodologies that have been used in the last 20, 30 years would be uh, in the Maya area of magnetometry, uh, ground spectroscopy, uh, and satellite survey. And while those could all be good, there are some problems with the Maya area. It's not metal rich, so magnetometry doesn't really help very well. Uh, if you're looking at satellite survey, as we're going to see in just a moment, the forest canopy can sometimes be so thick that you can't recognize where an urban center might have been or to what extent uh, that urban center might have uh, encompassed a large sweep of area, including where the agricultural areas that would have fed those sites could have been. And this all started to change in around 2008 with a technology called light, ranging, or light detection and ranging, or LIDAR for short, which is a technology that's usually um, associated with lasers that are coming from a, they're either connected to a device on a biplane or uh, now through drones, which can start to give you a virtual sense of the landscape by removing a tree line. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Uh, but the other side of this is, despite the fact that we have these cool new technologies uh, to remove the tree line, to get a better sense of what cities actually look like, we don't use uh, other forms of remote sensing very often at all that can also often enhance this type of technology. So that's where I'm going to talk more on the second half of this discussion today with ground penetrating radar. Now, looking at the, this map I have of Eastern Mesoamerica today, where you can see the Yucatan Peninsula uh, over on the center of this map, and you can see that this area of the world is this ecological mosaic. You have so many different forms of dense forest ecologies in the area that, that it's no wonder that it's incredibly difficult to understand what a city would look like. Uh, and one of the sites we're going to look at in a moment, we, we know that the early archaeologists at the site didn't know the difference between when they were on a mountain or a pyramid, so much so that they thought that uh, the pyramids that they were on were part of or built on top of a mountain, not recognizing that the mountain itself was actually a very large pyramid. And that site that we're going to spend our first time, uh, our first example with is Caracol in Belize. Uh, I was lucky enough to be doing my field work as a very young archaeologist back in 2008, uh, getting a sense of what this new technology was going to be. Uh, and this was the time when the first LIDAR survey had been carried out at an archaeological site uh, in Mesoamerica. And so Arlen and Diane Chase, who were the directors of this project, uh, at that point centered at the University of Central Florida, were really interested in this technology because it could give you a sense of what the landscape was like, removing at least in their minds some form of vegetation. Now, they had a lot of questions about the landscape of Caracol, despite the fact that they had been working there for 28 field seasons, mapping every single year. And this small map over here on the right, it gives you a sense of the urban monumental core of Caracol. And this was the major areas where the excavations of the site uh, had been focused. To give you a sense of this large area right here, uh, I'm going to give us our, our first aerial view uh, through Google Earth to give you a sense of what Caracol looks like today. Now, if you squint really hard, you'll see that there is a superimposed three-dimensional square pyramid smack dab in the center of this image. That would be that largest piece of the urban center mapped by Arlen and Diane Chase. Uh, and you can also see some small cleared areas around there as well. That would also be the rest of that monumental core that had been excavated and consolidated by their team as well as by the Institute of Belizean Archaeology. You can also see the one road that gets you into this site. Uh, it's about a three and a half hour drive on a good day uh, to the next nearest city. So it's certainly an adventure to get out there. Now, you're not really seeing much over here either. Uh, there's not much in the way that's obvious that there was an ancient city here that could have had between 65 or maybe even 85,000 people in its heyday. It doesn't really give you that impression. So what LIDAR does is it removes that tree canopy uh, almost in its entirety. And what you can see here, if you focus on the center of this uh, LIDAR rendered image, you can see that main central pyramid over there uh, that was almost entirely covered by dense forest canopy. You can also see how uneven the ground is, how the terrain uh, is incredibly hilly and in those hilly areas around the main core of the site, you can see hundreds of agricultural terraces, 
giving you a sense of what food production was like in this ancient settlement. That was something that they were never able to document before. Uh, and this first survey really gave uh, archaeologists in Mesoamerica a deep understanding of that how different cities were subsisting off of uh, agriculture, whether it was slash and burn, the use of Bajo valleys, uh, having extensive floodplains, or extensive terracing like this. Uh, it just wasn't clear how much variability there was. And we're finally getting a sense of that. I also want to draw your attention here to some of the more white, taller portions uh, of this landscape that are actually themselves monumental constructions. These are all monumental buildings uh, on the right side of the uh, image here, and none of those had been excavated by the chases. Not only that, you ended up finding causeways and road, uh, roadways to outside satellite sites, showing that this was a vast network of places. So LIDAR really was a game changer in giving you a layout of the landscape. Now, what I want to do here is to put a few caveats on this. Uh, I can talk about how LIDAR is the best technology ever made and how it just transformed archaeology so much, but we have to understand a number of limitations. First, it's not a map. It's augmentative to mapping, and it can certainly help with mapping. But every feature that you see uh, through LIDAR isn't always going to be a clear, pristine pyramid. In fact, the best preserved looking images the, or the best details you get of pyramids through LIDAR tend to be those that are already consolidated. So if it happens to be a structure covered by trees uh, and covered by dirt, you're really not going to get all of that detail there. So everything that you're looking at, many of these cool features have to be ground truth that is verified through excavation. The other thing that it might be a little obvious, but it's something that needs a little bit of explaining, and that's that LIDAR doesn't act as a time machine. It doesn't give you the image of the world as it was. It's giving you a landscape that is clear of vegetation today. At best, you're getting a sense of what the, the site of Caracol looked like at its abandonment, rather than the site of Caracol in its heyday, full of people, full of districts that are uh, booming, while also having districts that have gone into disuse, perhaps even for hundreds of years. Uh, Caracol, in fact, is a city that existed for about 700 years throughout the Maya Classic period. So it was a site that was constantly changing and modifying. Uh, it'd be the same way as comparing what Boston might have looked like 150 years ago to Boston today, and it'd be quite significantly different. Uh, and all that to say is there's no obvious change over time that you can read into LIDAR images with. Uh, and that comes from the fact that the ancient Maya, like we do with construction today, tended to bury their constructions under new constructions. So sometimes this would be new roadways were built over by old roadways, but Pyramids, for example, tended to be like Russian nesting dolls, where you build a new pyramid right over top of the next one, sometimes as many as eight times. Uh, and the site of Copan, you can just see all of the reconstructions of several phases of pyramids built on again and again and again and again. So that's something you have to bear in mind uh, when looking at the landscapes of the ancient Maya. Now, in order to get past some of these limitations with LiDAR technology, uh, my plan has been to use ground penetrating radar, which in fact is an older technology, but it can have promise with establishing an ability to chronicle change over time through those LiDAR images, while also giving you uh, augmentative sets of three-dimensional data to help you see what's underneath the ground. In particular, what's underneath the ground that the ancient Maya continually built upon. And I'll get to where this works best in a few moments. And my investigations are currently using ground penetrating radar uh, with LIDAR to help give us a better understanding, not only of change over time, but of the features that the Maya used without creating uh, a more destructive form of archaeology. As I mentioned before, LIDAR often gives you features that you didn't know exist, but you have to go in and excavate them. Ground penetrating radar can give you a quicker way to access whether or not a feature happens to be something cultural or not, while giving you a sense of uh, an augmentative ability to lens it or even map it uh, that minimizes that risk of destruction. Okay, so let's see, how are we doing? We're doing fairly good on time so far. So now I'm gonna take you with this in mind to where my work has been centered at in the Yucatan Peninsula of the Northern Maya area uh, outside of the site of Yashuna. And to give you a sense of what the ground looks like in the Northern Maya lowlands, it's incredibly flat. So I have this image here 
of a forest uh, of our forest canopy once it's cleared for agricultural use for corn farming each year uh, and you get a sense of just how flat this terrain really is but something that's worth considering here is that despite how flat it is it, this isn't an easy place to go mountain biking in. You have a lot of rocks all over the place. In fact, you have a ton of sinkholes that are often not visible to the naked eye, completely covered by brush uh, that can be incredibly dangerous, mind you. Uh, so that's something to be mindful of and be aware of. And that's that this landscape, despite it being relatively flat, it's not perfectly flat. And I'm emphasizing that perfectly flat because if you see something through LIDAR that's perfectly flat, that should be your first indication that that is a cultural feature and not a natural feature of the landscape itself. Now, in 2014, uh, the first LIDAR survey was done at the site of Yashuna, where I was working on my dissertation research. Uh, and to give you a sense of what that landscape was from Google Earth at that time, you have this image of the archaeological site of Yashuna. And with the LIDAR, you're able to get a sense of not just removing the tree canopy, but getting a heightened sense of the unevenness of the ground, revealing some households and other monumental forms of buildings. To do that, pay attention to the middle area uh, labeled Zona Arqueológica de Yashuna. You can see that there are small roads and pathways around that area. Now, keep your eye on that as the LIDAR survey comes in around those roads. And you can see just how much has been revealed by this imagery in a relatively flat area. Uh, so the forest canopy, even in the Maya North, can really obfuscate what you see. Now, much of this area that we see here had been mapped out since the early 1990s over a 15 year project to produce a map that I'll lay over here. Uh, now that extensive map, was fairly good. It gave you a good sense of where many of these features came out through LIDAR. There are a couple caveats to that. First, if you look at that central cluster of monuments, you'll see that one of the mapped pyramids tends to be very square-like. Uh, but in fact, it, it was not a square at all. It's very circular. Uh, and it's also not quite in the precise area. And as you look to certain overlaps, especially at the edges of the map, you'll see that certain monuments that were mapped don't quite fit in with the actual landscape as it's been documented through LIDAR. So the further you got away from that site core, the more of an error sort of crept in. The other thing you'll notice is, is that the orange area detailing where the mapping had taken place, it ends, but the settlement around this ancient city doesn't. So you can see that the sprawl beyond what had been documented archaeologically was far greater. Now, the latter survey was actually quite extensive, uh, done by Travis Stanton, uh, Lee Magnoni, and Tracy Ardron. And so you get the sense of the wider networks around this monumental core of the site. Uh, the areas that are highlighted in blue circles here are representing early Maya buildings or buildings with at least early components that would date to around uh, 600 BC through about uh, 200 BC. Uh, and some of the yellow and green circles actually represent more monumental areas that had not been quite documented, but are suspected to date to that early time period as well. Now, going back into the center of this site, uh, here I'm taking an image of that LIDAR that's been reprocessed with color to give you a better sense of the general topography and layout of the land. And this yellow, this yellowish cluster of of relatively flat looking areas uh, is certainly man-made. It's certainly human-made. And you can get a sense of this very irregular for the area landscape that's relatively flat surrounding much of these monuments. And that's where most of my work to look at the, cell, uh, the development of the site had taken place. Now, when you zoom in to the main core of the early site of Yashuna, you can see in the outline of red that incredibly flat topography right there and how extensive it truly is. There are a couple divots that I've marked with a navy blue, uh, in particular the triangular divot that you might see uh, just above the area labeled E group was a patch of land that we had cleared to park our, our vehicle. So that was a parking space that we developed. There are also two lines up there uh, in that uh, relatively flat expanse between that pyramid to the left and this long uh, rectangular range structure to the right. And those two very tiny lines represented uh, the 
western and eastern portions of a building that had been entirely buried by plaza construction. Uh, so what I'm getting at there is you have entire monumental buildings that are actually contained within this flat space, wholly buried. This landscape changed so many times and you would never have gotten that through LIDAR, although you are able to see the scars of the excavations that we were doing at that very time. Now, how did I know that that was a monumental building? Well, because I spent four and a half years excavating it. Uh, and you can see here these tiny squares on the map. Uh, and each one of those little white and blue squares is a two meter by two meter area. Uh, there are well over 40 squares on this map. Uh, and all the squares that are, have a, a cross hatching to them, they're intentionally small here to give you a sense of the fact that that was the only areas that we were able to get down to bedrock. So this was an extensive area that was incredibly deep and had a lot of diversity in terms of uh, structures, features, and other buildings that were not clear when you were looking on the surface above. Now, adding to that was the fact that there were 11 floor phases within this cleared space. 11 layers of monumental construction that all were associated to different buildings. So there was no way we could have possibly excavated this area, which would have been roughly the size of an American football field, all the way down to its earliest phase to have seen and mapped out all of the construction phases. So entering late into this phase uh, of excavations, my questions then started to focus on how do we get a sense of how, trans, uh, how change over time is happening in this early part of the city if we can't excavate it? How can we augment our LIDAR lens with uh, using other forms of remote sensing technology. So here is where we began using uh, ground penetrating radar for the first time. Uh, and this was an attempt to get rid of, or to get around these time intensive, costly endeavors of incredibly deep and physically taxing archeological excavations. Now, there were a lot of reasons to not use ground penetrating radar. Uh, there have been many criticisms over the years that ground penetrating radar doesn't work well on the limestone landscape uh, and that fill will render the radar produced from uh, your units useless. Uh, that is true when you're sticking a ground penetrating radar unit on top of a pyramid. That is not true when you're placing it on a flat and prepared surface. Uh, they're quite different. So that critique can be pushed aside by recognizing that there is a distinction between where you can use this technology, not that it doesn't work. Uh, another critique has been that the landscape is incredibly rugged, uh, it's full of trees, things that could obscure remote sensing uh, and your ability to sense the, the surface beneath your feet. This is absolutely true, but this is where you have to plan ahead and not just hope for the best by bringing a ground penetrating unit radar unit to the field and working with it. So, so it requires planning uh, that can be well tailored to uh, a LIDAR survey that has already been conducted. The, uh, other thing to keep in mind is that plazas, the area where I was working, these town squares have often been treated as empty space uh, because of their flatness rather than them being recognized as incredibly dynamic spaces that changed quite substantially over time. Uh, so that being said, ground penetrating radar actually does have a lot of promise with many uh, sites in the Maya area, particularly when you're going to be looking at uh, well-prepared flat surfaces like plazas, uh, like in the situation where I was working, as well as in looking for agricultural features which may be obfuscated by uh, soil accumulation over time. And this has been demonstrated through my and Peter Leach's work with ground penetrating radar uh, since about 2011 in different, uh, at different types of sites throughout the eastern lowlands of Mesoamerica. The other thing to say about this is not many people have realistically been using this technology. It's very well uh, underused in the area, uh, and I hope to change that in the next few years. Now, if we're looking at this image here on my left, we're getting a sense of what the ultrasound produced that this ground penetrating radar uh, was giving us. And here it's a time slice giving you 10 centimeters at a time, rendering uh, certain anomalies and possible features that we were able to document on the western portion of that plaza, an area that had not been excavated. Now, from that image, we were able to produce a number of let's call them informed anomalies at different depths that we could assign to stratigraphy that we had already known through uh, painstaking excavations over four and a half years. 
And what we're able to do uh, with this ground penetrating radar to situate it in a way that helped us understand where we were was to build in a number of uh, build a number of heuristics, laying out this grid uh, between two previously excavated areas so that we would definitely document them as we were going along, but also by uh, detailing three different ways we could test how GPR was working and what the return on the results was. So from here, I'm going to discuss the results or the implementation of our three tests and the results that we were able to find. Uh, the first was to see if we could use ground penetrating radar uh, in its immediacy to detect uh, any type of sub-feature or the presence of ritual activities in an area that we were going to close for excavation. The second test was to the, the detection of known yet unexcavated features. And the third test was to detect and map features with some precision that had never been excavated or documented otherwise. So the first test, we decided to detect some of these features uh, when we entered the field you know, and to determine if we should keep excavating deeper. And to do this, we opened it up in a small, tiny, clear area on a plaza floor. Uh, we called it floor number six in a sequence that was about a meter and a half beneath the surface. So we ran our unit uh, in this area and were able to, to detect a few small stratigraphic breaks, which seem to suggest a possible intrusion. So we decided to open up this area in order to see perhaps if there was evidence of some ritual activity. And as we opened up a very small con concentrated 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter unit, we came into the next floor level and found that in that floor level, there were a number of boulders stacked inside of a tiny little cut, a square intentionally made cut in the floor. We removed those boulders and cut the area around it through excavation to reveal a small capstone that had been placed over top of uh, an area that had been intentionally laid out with a number of artifacts, including uh, this little fragment here of polished magnetite or of iron ore. Uh, now, polished magnetite like this was actually something not too common in the Maya area, but common in the Olmec area. This actually ended up being the earliest evidence we were able to see of at least down the line trade uh, with an, a more well-known, for, uh, for lack of a better term, Olmec resource showing up in the midst of the Maya North. That's pretty rare. You don't typically find these materials. Uh, so we were able to see that there were absolutely intentionally placed uh, cuts that we could detect quite radically. But what about our second test? Could we detect features that we suspected existed but had not excavated yet. Well, one feature that we knew would likely run through this area was a small roadway that went through the plaza at roughly about 50 centimeters to about 80 centimeters beneath the surface of the soil. And we knew that it was running east to west. It ran into the uh, easternmost expansion of the plaza and we had confirmed it meeting on the easternmost expansion as well. Lo and behold, the ground penetrating radar was absolutely able to give us uh, the continuation of this causeway, you can see revealed an excavation here. So we're able to identify these features uh, in an already mapped on area, which was very, very cool and revealing to us. But of course, the third and real test would be, can you document new features? So to do this uh, in a period of about a week and a half, uh, we set out to excavate one feature that we had labeled, that we had noticed here, which was the presence of this yellow, or this platform, and it wasn't a yellow platform, but it's outlined in yellow here, uh, to give us a sense of what was this feature that seemed to be showing up at about 50 centimeters below the surface. It looked like it could be a rectangular platform. That seemed quite odd to be in the middle of an otherwise empty flat space. So the ground penetrating radar revealed what might have been a wall, a small platform, and a number of different stratigraphic uh, stratigraphic layers. These layers did confirm or conform well to our already pre-established uh, pre stratigraphy, so we just wanted to get a better sense of what it was. Now, in placing the excavation unit that was a one meter by two meter area right here, you can see that within a matter of a few centimeters by removing the topsoil, we had actually encountered a break in an early plaza floor. It was a circular cut surrounded by three post holes that you can see around the edges of this area. And in the middle of this was an accumulation of rocks that were intentionally placed all surrounded and covered in ash. So this was not a typical type of thing to find. And it was just beneath the soil surface. 
In fact, I've argued uh, elsewhere that this is a termination ritual, a ritual that would have marked the end of the living space in the Maya cosmology. Now, once I found that space, we needed to return to the ground penetrating radar data to get a sense of what that was. And lo and behold, if you look to the left here and you follow that red line, you'll see that there's a very circular image that comes out of this uh, field of view. Now, once you go a bit deeper and you look to the right of this image, you see that that circular area becomes quite rectangular, quite square. That's a, a pretty weird anomaly. So we decided to continue digging down to see what we could do to make sense of this. And as we dug down, we hit not just something that happened to be circular by proxy of it being a circular cut in the ground, but if you look closely at that image of the left, you'll see that there was actually a circular ring of stones that ended up being a sort of well-like feature that was stacked three tiers of stones high. So you ended up having a, a human-made well-like feature in the middle of this plaza. Furthermore, uh, we saw that this well was actually situated within a larger expanse, as you can see here through the uh, through our time slice with the GPR profile, giving you this more organized uh, stratigraphic anomaly. So as we dug down further, we removed the stones around this feature uh, that was otherwise contained with small cobbles and once again in ash and small amounts of earth. And it gave us a very interesting anomaly that ended up being a small earthen platform that was uh, a rectangular earthen platform that had a circular well inside of it. And to emphasize this even more, as we removed the earthen platform, we actually saw evidence of the incised lines demarking where this was to be constructed on that plaza floor as it was built up. So we saw evidence of intentional planning going into this anomaly that we were able to detect through ground penetrating radar. So it was something that we were able to confirm quite rapidly in an excavation that only took us a week and a half to pinpoint and complete through this technology. And uh, just giving you a sense of the stratigraphic profile produced by our GPR unit here, mixed with the drawings that were done of our profiles uh, afterwards, you can get a sense of how those breaks do align. And in fact, there's going to be some variation. You're not going to get the best precision in the world always with GPR, but you get the larger episodic breaks quite clearly. So you may not get fine pronounced stratigraphy with every single floor episode, but you'll get at least a few large ones. And that's something to keep in mind as a small limitation, but as an informative one nonetheless. Now, uh, I know that we're out of time, uh, and I wanted to just showcase these findings because they're really informing where my work is going in the next few years, uh, where we're gonna be targeting a number of already documented uh, features with LIDAR and seeing how they match into the landscapes at large in Chiapas, Mexico, and in Yucatan. Uh, so I want to just end there by expressing that the, through this technology, you can get a true diachronic view of how settlements and cities grew over time uh, in the Maya area. So I'll open it up to questions. Well, thank you for that, Ryan. Yes, everyone, uh, please send in your questions to the chat function. Um, but while we're waiting for that, um, I'll start with my question. It's the one I've been asking everyone. Um, what got you interested in studying the Maya? That is such a great question. Um, I think what really got me interested in studying the Maya in particular uh, were my mentors, Arlen and Diane Chase, who I definitely gave a shout out to in this lecture. Um, it, it was the two of them uh, who introduced me into archaeology uh, as a discipline. I was interested in doing excavations, but I didn't know about the whole grounding in anthropology uh, until I met them. And they really sold me on the Maya uh, in framing the ancient civilization as a puzzle, uh, as a puzzle that we could all contribute to as scholars, but as a puzzle that we could not solve as individuals. Uh, and I've really liked that, and it's something I've carried with me since then. Thank you. Okay, so we have one question. I, I like it. Um, so do you have to bring your own equipment down? And if so, how do you actually get it down there? <laughs> Oh, this can be very painstaking. And thank you for the question. Um, so when you're traveling with large scale uh, equipment like ground penetrating radar uh, and drones, you can fly them, uh, but it ends up being very expensive. So usually we have to fly the equipment down. Uh, this doesn't always happen when you are able to establish a long-term field camp. Then you can have your equipment brought down or even uh, bought and housed in Mexico proper. 
which is a lot better than traveling with it constantly because you can run into several issues with equipment breaking down through travel. Uh, and I've certainly been there. I've certainly wanted to kick uh, a GPR unit for not working uh, in the past. So this is something to keep in mind. Excellent. You want to go on office space, right? Exactly. Right? PC load letter. Um, oh, hold on. Uh, can you, so we have the comment. Can you comment on the Teotihuacan like orientation? Mm. Uh, with the site of Yashina in particular, uh, there is, if, um, no, forgive me if I'm misrepresenting uh, what the question is, but uh, there are certainly some uh, overlaps, we might say, with uh, urban development, urban sprawl with the site of Yashina in particular that could align with the orientation of Teotihuacan. Uh, there are roadways at this site. In fact, we see that there are roadways at many sites. Uh, but with Yashuna, uh, Yashuna doesn't really, in my mind, constitute a, uh, a very well-planned city. Uh, Teotihuacan is an incredibly well-planned, uh, incredibly organized uh, city uh, with grid-like features uh, that are quite extensive. Uh, Yashuna, while well, it got to be a small-scale town of about maybe 4,000, we estimate, at an absolute peak, that's an upper end more uh, more liberal view of what the population was, certainly not a conservative estimate, uh, where Teotihuacan could have been housing uh, 100,000 or 150,000 or more people at a given point of time. So there are certainly some very uh, large distinctions to be made there. Uh, one thing else I would also draw attention to with Yashina is that it's far older uh, than Teotihuacan. The time period we're looking at here runs roughly from about uh, 900 BC to about uh, maybe 200 or even uh, 100 BC, where Teotihuacan really starts to come into its prominence uh, around 50 BC, uh, leading into about 550 or so AD. Perfect. Well, those are the questions that we have. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Collins. And to our audience, um, join us in two weeks for Dave Robinson, who will be talking about underwater archaeology. So again, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Lindsay. It's a pleasure to be here. Bye.